Y612 presents Artificial Intelligence and Digital Transformation. Thank you all for coming. My name is JC Berg, and I'm a VP on the I612 board. A um, few quick housekeeping things. Uh, right after we are done, there will be a question and answer panel, so keep in mind if you have questions. Um, and then we will do the raffle at the very end um, and be wrapping up at 1 o'clock. So without further ado, I would like to welcome uh, Phil Schrader, President and COO of Gum Gum to the stage. Thank you so much, JC, I appreciate it. Good afternoon, everybody. So what we're gonna talk about a little bit is, is basically how our brand's benefiting from AI, 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 excuse me, AI. So what we're gonna focus on is, you know, for us, we're asked a lot of times by marketers, you know, how can we really use AI effectively? So over the course of this presentation, what we're gonna focus on is some examples of how machine learning, a subset of AI, has been used effectively by many marketers, as well as many of you as brands in the audience are already using AI or machine learning through things like programmatic buying. Um, if you're using chatbot, marketing, if you're using visual search, you are using AI. But there's also a subset of AI that I'm going to focus on as we go through this presentation called computer vision. So as the world continues to become more visual, how are brands, marketers, and just the overall advertising industry really leveraging computer vision to really help unlock the value and understand everything around visual content? So let's talk a little bit about what's been happening with AI around machine learning specifically. And so machine learning, just at the very basis, is just basically providing machines with data and letting them learn for themselves. So a few examples of some brands and how they've actually used machine learning. And we did this through kind of a little bit of the customer journey. So the first column being segmentation, understanding your customers. The second being more around prospecting. And the third on retention. So as you look at Sephora, Sephora wanted to understand how they could leverage all of their customer data and use machine learning to effectively reach their audience and customer. So they partnered with their digital consulting company, with Microsoft, to integrate machine learning into creating the ability to create dynamic messaging to their customers at the time of new inventory, sales of products they loved, and then be able to reach them via SMS, um, email, or even direct mail. In the sense of Stella, Stella identified that within the weather, every time there were a two degree change, upward tick, they actually saw an increase in sales. So what they did was they used machine learning to measure the temperature within different DMAs, and then once that temperature exceeded by 2% the weather, they, uh, they uh, activated a digital out-of-home campaign that allowed them to then create digital messaging in those markets. And they saw over year over year a 65% increase on the actual revenue from that strategy. Additionally, the cost of that campaign was 50% less in driving additional value at a more efficient cost basis. So as you move into prospecting, we're all familiar with retargeting. Right? Well, Malaysia Airlines did a retargeting campaign in which they did retarget, but they retargeted and they retargeted in a way where they optimized to the content and to where they knew that the consumer was still in that frame of mind. And when they retargeted in that way, they saw a 1,200% increase in month-over-month -month sales from that uh, strategic initiative. With Toomey, Toomey wanted to continue to grow and create new customers. So what they did was they worked with Pebble Post. They got access to intent and interest data, and they created dynamic email marketing campaigns to new prospects in that they created significant increase in the amount of value they received with 17, 17 times better return on advertising spend. And then obviously there's retention. So how do you keep engagement with your, with your consumers, with your customers? In the case of Lyft, Lyft now is available for you to be able to call a ride through Slack, right, through Facebook Messenger, and now even through voice technologies through your Amazon Echo. And in the case of H&M, H&M now allows you to be able to post a photo to their website 
and they will use visual image recognition technology to kind of help make recommendations on other articles of clothing that look similar to help guide you towards getting that style. So as, as you look at these, these are all references to various ways that machine learning is very much embedded and seen tremendous amount of success within the marketing landscape today. And so those are all things that we as an industry can be you know, executing on today as well. Specifically within the programmatic space, which we all are in, you know, machine learning is really at the core of all of the different tactics and ways that we're buying programmatically whether that's through targeting and all the different levels of targeting, whether that's through access of inventory, or whether that's through just the creation of dynamic creative messaging, all of which machine learning is at the core of a lot of those different tactics, right? The machine has been fed data and they're making decisions without being taught on what the outcome should be. They're actually creating and making the outcome to provide all of us in this room and brands especially the most effective outcomes. But machine learning is really not where it needs to just stop or continue to evolve. Computer vision is really what we think is the next phase that the advertising and marketers and brands really need to start to understand more about and really develop more into their strategy. So what is computer vision? Well, basically, computer vision is just teaching a machine to be able to see like humans. And why is it important that we think of things like computer vision is because visual content is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. So 21 billion images or photos are taken daily. 45 billion cameras are expected globally in 2022, which is two and a half times the amount there are now. 80% of the internet uses vi is video related and 95 million images and videos are shared on Instagram alone. So if we all know as, as marketers or as in this advertising world that that's where we know visual content is going, why do we not have better ways to be integrating AI solutions, specifically computer vision, into our strategy? And so what, what is the current state of computer vision within marketing? Well, right now, 80% of, of visual content is basically um, important for the for these strategies is how it's used. So you're looking at visual search, advertising, augmented reality, VR, right? And all those are how brands are starting to look at it, but you're running into, that's still not really reaching anything. You're not reaching scale. You're not really unlocking the data. You're not really looking at it as a way to activate computer vision in your everyday buying. And so from Digiday, when you actually, they did a survey, right? Only 12% of marketers or advertisers are using a form of computer vision. And of those 12%, how are they using it? They're using image recognition, a part of computer vision, primarily to measure unsafe content and create a brand environment, to reach and value the actual visual branding that they're looking to achieve. And only 10% of the 12% are actually using it in targeting. You know, one of the head of initiatives, Aaron Rack, basically has said, at this point, everything they do is visual. In a poll to marketers, 95% of marketers are actually building marketing strategies that are solely based on visual performance. So if visual content is king, then we believe computer vision is the key. So for us at GumGum, Gum, who we are, is we teach mis machines to be able to solve for problems for various industries by teaching them to see just like a human. We've done this since 2008, so we're primarily focusing on advertising, but we've also used this technology on sports, valuation and sponsorship. As we think about how we look at current budgets being allocated by brands today, they still are very siloed. So when someone buys the actual sponsorship of, say, the Minnesota Vikings, how much penetration did they get on social? How much penetration did they get on editorial? Where's the earned value? Well, computer vision and the logo detection and the ability to be able to understand that can really provide a CMO with really important data to really help them allocate their funds appropriately. And then, not that it's relevant to this room, but GumGum Gum has its own dental line of business as well. So we actually have the large, world's largest proprietary data set on all dental x-rays. 
and we've provided the best in class service to the ability in the dental field to be able to use how we can identify of the 20 top pathologies with the best in class confidence to aid a dentist. So yes, they're different, but that's our core. Our technology is our core, and this is how we're activating it and using it across uh, multiple industries. Specifically within advertising, what we're doing is we're processing the full content of the page. So obviously image recognition is at the core of what we do. So what we do is we're able to use that technology to scan and understand everything on that page. That includes not just the actual image recognition piece, like the automobile, the face, nudity or skin detection, but it's also using in the semantic analysis of under, understanding the meaning of that content of that image and mirroring that with the metadata and keyword data on that page to give a true 360 degree look of all of that content. And in processing those billions of images per month, we're able to do this in real time and we're able to become more sophisticated in understanding what those, what those classif classifications of images actually are. So what do you do with all of that? So this is our technology at its core. What, what and how does that actually work for a brand? So I'm just going to walk you through a few different case studies so that you can actually see how brands have actually unlocked that value. This is a contextual targeting case study with Vodafone out of the UK. The launch of the iPhone X in 2017 was the biggest event in every telco's calendar, with all of the networks competing hard to reach the most highly prized customers. Vodafone wanted to use this event to clearly differentiate themselves from their competition. However, developing a campaign that would help them achieve this would not be easy, in part due to Apple's desire to ensure global consistency in the portrayal of their products. All networks have to adhere to Apple guidelines. In the case of the iPhone X launch, all ads featuring iPhone messaging could only appear on 50 pre-approved websites with fixed creative templates. This made standing out almost impossible. All of the telcos were reaching the same users with the same message in the same space. So how could Vodafone win the battle of the telcos without breaching these guidelines? While their competitors were investing millions within Apple's guidelines, Vodafone found a unique solution to this challenging brief. To create an online campaign that did not mention Apple or the iPhone X in any of its messaging, and to leverage the huge amount of organic editorial coverage of the launch to place these ads. Working with artificial intelligence company GumGum, Gum, Vodafone used sophisticated image recognition technology to target millions of iPhone images online and overlay them with their brand message, telling consumers that they had the latest smartphone without ever mentioning the device itself. This strategy allowed Vodafone to own all iPhone editorial content in complete isolation from their competitors, enabling them to achieve brand standout like never before and more importantly, to drive record-breaking sales. Engagement rates peaked at 28%, seven times higher than the industry average. Vodafone achieved their fastest ever morning of pre-order sales for the iPhone X launch. The data created by this approach directly helped Vodafone exceed sales targets, driving a 30% uplift year on year. But most importantly, Vodafone won the battle of the telcos, with market share increasing by 67% from the previous year. So when you look at this case study, which is really tied towards the ability to solve a problem that really leverages contextual targeting at its core, um, you can see the impact you can have. And when you think of contextual targeting overall, and the shift where contextual targeting has in many cases and many brands and agencies use it every day on every campaign has a lot of times been treated as a complement to the audience or the behavioral aspect of how they're currently buying. In this case in the UK as compliance issues with GDPR and even compliance issues now within the US that are moving our direction uh, we're based in Santa Monica there's a there's a, a something just passed in California regarding audience and user behavior that kind of mirrors something similar to GDPR that we're going to be harnessed and we're going to be a little bit more handicapped to a lot of the habits of what we've been accustomed to and driving value by unlocking that audience and behavioral data and so contextual targeting not only becomes just a complement I think it rises to a really fundamental core primary tactic that brands and agencies really need to elevate. And when you think of contextual targeting, the key to contextual targeting isn't just the text or the keywords, it's the visuals. And when you think of this case where we were able to, you know, in computer vision, 
technology go around the, the, the hindrance of the Apple rules and restrictions to drive a successful campaign that extends into other areas as well. If you think about how I mentioned on the sports sponsorship, of how sports sponsorship is currently taken, and many brands in this room, I'm sure, sponsor many events. And they're very expensive. But to be able to use computer vision to do a digital sponsorship that's never included in the traditional sponsorship so that your brand can even have a presence around that sponsorship at a much differentiated and cheaper cost is very valuable. If Mercedes-Benz is going to do Fashion Week, BMW can be a part of that digitally and own that space digitally across all the images and content at a much cheaper rate and be able to counter Mercedes-Benz potential gain of market share or awareness within that core demographic audience. And then here's an example of where dynamic creative comes into play. B&Q wanted to raise awareness of their in-store paint pro service, a market leading offering that allows customers B&Q wanted to raise awareness of their in-store paint pro service, a market-leading offering that allows customers to accurately match paint against any color they request. After launching the service, B&Q found customers were struggling to imagine items they could bring in store to duplicate, so they approached MEC Global to develop an imaginative digital campaign to raise awareness of the service and make customers more aware of the possibilities. Working with computer vision company GumGum, MEC Global developed an innovative campaign that involved running highly visible ads within editorial images on articles rather than standard ad slots. Using GumGum's sophisticated image recognition technology, the ads analyzed millions of pixels contained within the images across premium publishers and recognized specific colors before optimizing the color of the ad to match the item in the analyzed image. This simple but innovative approach allowed B&Q to perfectly illustrate the color matching product using content the consumer wanted to view. Overall, the campaign saw an increase across all of the brand objectives, with a 2.5% increase in the association B&Q has as being the place to buy paint as well, and a 4.8% increase in the association of B&Q to color matching services. This campaign was a very positive result for B&Q, as the creativity and technology within the campaign allowed for significantly increased awareness and perception metrics against their biggest product category. I know I'm running out of time, so I just have one more slide. So obviously dynamic creative is an opportunity there too. As you just think of everything in an image, how do brands take advantage of that? And even when you look beyond just say paint, other CPGs, right? There are so many CPG clients that are looking to educate on other uses. Windex also cleans stainless steel. How do you start to tie in those other uses and how do you then help achieve those objectives for different brands um, leveraging uh, computer vision? And finally, um, Canon. Um, we did a, a campaign with Canon in which we basically created two sets of campaigns. It was called Canon C Possible, where they wanted to target different um, images of cameras and photos and all of that, and create an experience in which you can actually highlight them using and identifying the camera in a way to call out brand and unsafe branded content. So at GumGum, our core, we're able to look at brand safety. So everybody uses brand safety, NLP, they have a third-party brand safety provider, but they can't really call out through computer vision what's in that photo. Is there a gun? Is there a swastika? Something that you don't want to be associated with. If it's not in the text of the page, you're missing it, even with your current providers. Um, so we use that capability to then leverage a campaign for Canon to show how their cameras can capture different elements within a photo. Um, and they saw a, a tremendous success with this campaign as well. So there's just these are different ways that computer vision now can start to take a little bit more of kind of a front seat into how we look at strategies for brands, given the fact that everything continues to go visual. So um, hopefully that uh, you guys learned a little bit. And now I guess it's time for the panel. But thank you guys so much for uh, your time. And I'll introduce Jeff, who will come up and kick this off.
All right, thank you, Phil. Please have a seat. We'll get our tech sorted out. Um, my name is Jeff Huang, Associate Media Director at Essence, working on the Target business. And uh, I want to welcome to the stage our other panelists that are going to be joining uh, Phil here. And we'll have a little chat about uh, AI and uh, how it's going to transform digital um, in more ways than just advertising, perhaps. Um, so I'm going to start with Greg Jones, Associate Media Director at Hayworth. Uh, Jacob Grebchevsky, um, Head of Product Management at Zaxis, Bill Sears, Vice President of Strategic Solutions at Seismic, and Katie Ford, Chief Client Officer at Moby. Excellent. So to start, Phil, during his keynote, uh, talked about, gave a lot of examples of, of how uh, companies are, are looking at and using machine learning. Um, for the rest of the panelists, uh, I want to start with you guys and getting some perspective, because we have a really diverse group here from agencies, suppliers, supply side platforms. Uh, wanted to hear from you guys of conversations that you've had and where marketers are currently seeing uh, AI and where their heads are at. So why don't we start with Jacob? Sure. Um, we're hearing uh, a lot of confusion really around some of the core concepts still. And it's, it's a new field and I think it's easy for, for AI to get wrapped up into being one big thing that addresses all use cases. And I think what you saw from Phil's slides is that there are different applications of AI and they're actually different technologies and part one is just educating our clients and the teams we work with internally on you know what do all these terms mean what is AI what is machine learning what's a model what's an algorithm enough that you can start making useful um, you know distinctions between the different services um, and the other thing we get is often how does you know for example what you do at Zaxis uh, compare with IBM Watson or another platform and a lot of you know comparisons of what happens is uh, you know comparisons of different use cases side by side that don't quite overlap they're complementary so I think what we're hearing is the need for better education and a better um, overview of what all this means and how it can be applied. Excellent. Anybody else? Oh, I always have something to say. Oh, uh, go yeah. for it, Bill. So I, I liked the image that you gave us of sort of the molecular level of what the artificial intelligence is out to do. And you're absolutely right. Education is a, a huge, huge piece. I think where we're kidding all of our clients is there's no single AI yet that's going to be able to do everything, right? Google's, I'm sure, working on it diligently. <laughs> uh, I don't know about you, but Alexa failed me twice this morning. So until we get there, we have to think about how do we make AI work with AI? And how do we as marketers think about the, not just the benefit, but the outcome we want from AI and approach it from that direction and then let all the rest of the smart technologists in the world tell us what we need. You know, and, and I'd put that on all of us most likely too, right? We need to help our clients get there. But I think if we start with what do you have and what are you trying to accomplish, we're going to end up with a better meld of AI, right? Your AI is going to find the picture a lot better. Maybe my AI is going to find the right opportunity for the, for the best bidding opportunity. Right, you, you really need AIs working together, and that's honestly driving. You can put it on my platform. Right, right. but but it's driving <laughs> it's, dri it's driving the confusion and the complexity that all of our clients, probably many of you in the room, are like, oh my gosh, I'm so sick of hearing about AI. Well, which which also leads that AI to your point is it's it's we don't want it to be the next black box, right? The magic bullet that is the solve for for everything. So you know, seven eight years ago, program Act was this thing, this black box that everyone's like, oh, I have to I have to do it, but I don't know what that means. Um, the danger of AI is that it becomes this black box. Um, so, you know, our perspective is that being transparent, what is it solving for? Um, so being very tangible on the outcomes is critical. So um, it, it's, it's driving insights, it's driving optimization, it's driving decisioning. Um, but for us, really important that there's an opt-in and an opt-out. So there's decisions that are actually recommended, but that's for the client and the human intel to make to make that decision versus just leaving, leaving it up to the machine. I love that AI that learns and teaches. Yes, right? yeah. that's great. 
and to have points in the conversation. So I, you know, I come 24 years from the agency side and I went to what I call the bright side of tech um, and really translating what does it mean and it, literally taking use cases. Um, and you did a great job of actually showing the use cases of how, how do we get to the decision and are we going to make that decision or not um, versus just letting the machines kind of make those decisions for us. So I think that's a really important piece of the learning journey um, as we go through it. So it's not this magical thing, um, but there's some tangibility to it. I just want to add, I agree. I just think we should just stop trying to teach under the hood of what yeah. AI is. Try simple terms, mm -hmm. right? Like computer vision, right? Basically just teaches the machine to see. Now, see. How, how can we just collaborate and provide you a solution on something cool you want to do right. and then make sure it aligns with the objective, as Katie mentioned. And I think that, that that's how we can really take advantage of it. And for the marketers and agents out there, give a challenge and AI may be able to suffer it or not. Exactly. Right? So I'm trying to do this and there may be a result where AI can be a help. Um, but when we talk in terms of actual challenges to solve for, um, and it won't solve everything, uh, but having that conversation with your, your partners is probably the best way to approach it. Um, Greg, anything from an agency perspective? Sure. Um, you know, it's been my experience that we, uh, Everyone sitting in this room are in a unique position that we're typically three or four, maybe even five or six steps ahead of where our clients are. Um, and frankly, I've yet to have a conversation where it starts with a client saying, I don't get AI, why are we not doing more AI? Um, now, that being said, we are already utilizing it in a lot of ways, of, uh, a great way and a great job of illustrating, but um, I'm more thinking about, as I'm being three or four steps ahead, how we would utilize it practically for employment. Um, you gave some great examples, through some new case studies. Um, I think my head, honestly, is from a creative standpoint. Um, how the, the promise of AI, not just for media, but how it's going to make um, the creative that we're placing better. And um, the decisioning that can happen behind it, how that marriage of content and context ends up at the right place at the right time. So, so I love the tangibility of like how it could be. So, from a retail standpoint, just as give you guys some context as to what that could look like. So if there's an insight in retail that if you're more than six miles away from the store, that you're more apt to actually go on the online versus go in store. So the machine learning can actually say, I'm going to serve a, 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 an ad that actually meets your needs of actually that you're not going to go in store, but I'm actually, like the radius in which you live will actually help. It's, a, it's one signal of many. Um, to actually say, I'm going to serve this type of creative and this this you know message to you that's much more relevant uh, based on the signals that, that's, that's seen. But I agree, there's a long journey ahead because um, right now it's it's very um, efficiency based and operational organizational based. I think the the next frontier is really about marrying marrying that message, not creepy message mm -hmm. like it's following retargeting, but um, contextually relevant messages. Well, well to that so. Um... Alibaba has invested and created a, a creative platform called, and I'm probably butch, but it's Liban or Liban. And so China has essentially its own version of an Amazon Day or a Prime Day. Um, it's called Singles Day. They utilize this uh, this platform, this digital platform, to make its creative. Um, 400 million different pieces of creative made in one day by this one decision platform. So again, going back to this notion of we can take inputs like proximity what someone's browsing for, what they're looking at, but then actually in real time and in a smart way, put up the right message in front of them that will actually make them more likely to convert. I think that um, going towards down that path of content and personalization is what's most interesting. Cool. Well, generally speaking though, across the board, for, you know, we're in the advertising industry here, you talked about creative benefits. Are there other intrinsic benefits in, in terms of that AI could bring in other realms of what we do, like brand safety. Um, we talked about the benefits to targeting and matching that up with creative. Um, anything else that could come to mind across the panel here? I'll tell you one of my favorites, and it's actually something that's driven a lot of angst among a lot of our agency partners is data drudgery, right? The amount of time that we spend worrying about, thinking about, finding, collecting, talking about data as opposed to the amount of time we actually spend making sense of the data. And artificial intelligence across many of its applications is a fantastic engine to help free up ourselves and our people 
to get the signals out of the noise, right? To get the actual helpful, useful information out of everything that's available. And I think that's that's an enormous opportunity for all of us, right? To not only make our lives and our people's lives better, but to make the information that we're able to hand back to our clients more meaningful. All those planners are going to miss 7,000 lines of actually Excel um, because uh, AI is going to... I don't know if miss is the right I'm, word. I'm kidding, right I'm hand. kidding. But back in the good old days. I definitely want to stress the, the brand safety piece because for us, that's a huge tenet of what we do. When we think, and Katie mentioned, like the programmatic and everybody dove in and then it was, where's everything going? There was no transparency. Ads weren't serving. What sites, properties was I running on, right? We've all retreated back, right, to very specific. I want to want to, I want this PMP deal. I only want to run here. I don't want to run on news, right? So we've kind of taken a little bit away from what programmatic and optimization could actually lend us to reaching the wider audience on the web. I think brand safety is another key thing that we're missing out on because images, for example, are really not handled in brand safety. They are primarily by the keyword data or the natural language processing element of your current brand safety providers. That's how they're being measured. But the other content of that image from computer vision is not a function of that. So for us, how do we open up the doors to those news sites that has valuable users, that has really great content, but you feel a, a lot more safe knowing that there's a 360 degree view of was that a car crash, even if you didn't pick it up in the text. Especially anybody in this room knows that the tagging of photos in general is really poor. You look and, you know, I think this is Cher and all of a sudden it's a picture of a dog named Cher. I mean, so you, you're kind of running into those. So that's where computer vision and brand safety are, are, I think, really can tie in well with natural language processing. I think the key also is to think creatively so when we're working with a partner who wants to, who is a very uh, client who has ch children's toys, and their all struggle is reaching children's content effectively, but you can't target to kids, right? So I think Katie had a big point as well as Jeff is, what are the different technologies you can use? So we're at the table around the computer vision API component, and we're right next to the experts in the natural language processing component textual. How together can we combine and create a unique targeting opportunity for children's content, safe content, that then allows you to reach that group? Right? That's a new idea. That's a new way of being creative. Just asking a question, what can it do? Right. I love that even deciphering um, the next frontier we're even working on is deciphering emojis. Um, so today's youth actually don't even text in overall um, right. letters, but they express themselves in um, sentiment of emojis. So our NLP semantic um, uh, engine uh, brand intelligence is, is literally uh, understanding the context of what each emoji stands for. So there's, um, which is really interesting. One other thing that I think is is um, a benefit of AI, and I know we're not here to talk about blockchain, but when you talk, when you put those two things together, um, I do have a hope and aspiration that um, the amount of fraud um, in the supply chain can actually be mitigated, not eliminated, mitigated um, by AI with blockchain. There's some initiatives, um, and that will make us all feel better about the industry that we're in. Um, so I'm not saying it's going to be this year, um, but I think that that AI plus blockchain will actually it will be a key benefit. I think that's a that's a cue for I six one two to have actually a blockchain educational <laughs> session at some point. Um, Stay tuned. <laughs> Anybody else, Greg, Jacob? Yeah, I, I think the couple topics that um, you know Bill and Katie both pointed out earlier is the question needs to be about what outcome you're trying to achieve, and so one of the opportunities that we've found working with our agency partners is you have analytics teams who are working on accounts where the entire, you know, the process isn't entirely digital. Whether that's a healthcare brand or that's an automotive brand, um, a lot of the services and transactions are offline. But they've developed very sophisticated ways of measuring whether digital media is, is effective. And so you have analytics teams developing these measures. You have them showing this to the client. And what happens when it comes time to, you know, execute the next campaign is that gets reduced to a spreadsheet or that gets reduced to a PowerPoint slide and the person setting up, you know, the media buying is like, what am I supposed to do with that? So what we're able to do with our clients is to take those data points that they're, they're measuring for their offline uh, analytics and feed that into our machine learning system as a new target. So we're optimizing directly to the, 
result they're trying to measure um, and to kind of close the loop so you don't have this lost in translation at every step in every team. And I think that touches your point. You need to figure out ways to have all these AI systems work together in a way that ultimately solves your problem. I love the question of measurement, right? And so often we get into this circle that we self-define of measuring what's measurable. Right. You know, and, and to go back, I liked the solution, the, the case study for Vodafone, you actually change the rules, right? You said, rather than try and find where I can live within the rules, I'm just going to forget the rules and work outside of them. And it's the same idea for, for measurement. A lot of clients get stuck. And I encourage folks, go back and, and say, could I get a better measure? Could I measure something more meaningful if I literally just changed a step or two in my customer journey? And a lot of times you'll find the data you don't have, you can actually get your hands on if if you're smart about it, right? And sometimes it's a new partner, sometimes it's a new step, you know, ask them to log in earlier or offer an app or whatever it happens to be. But at the end of the day, break, change the rule, right? Yep. You, you change the rule, you can get a better thing you can measure towards and optimize against. Yeah, uh, all great thoughts, but there's definitely a lot of benefits that we typically talk about. Are there any, and, and I could think, of, are there any watchouts that we should have in, in terms of as AI proliferates, as there are more and more use cases? I point to like MIT doing, uh, uh, doing experiments by uploading Norman, Norman Bates novels and then creating an AI that's basically a serial killer at this point. It just doesn't have a body. Um, so where, what, are, what are the boundaries? As much as AI can bring benefits, I know we're talking about advertising, you know, but uh, um, are there any watchouts as it relates to our industry of bad behaviors, of, of, of things that we should be on the lookout for, or how we can potentially, as like an industry, govern ourselves to make sure that we're responsible and accountable? It's funny, I think we've, we've heard it where people try and do too much at one time. You know, where they either decide they have to become the technical expert when it's not necessary, uh, or they sort of try and do everything at one time. And organizationally, I don't know about your clients, my clients at least, organizationally they don't talk well to each other. Uh, there are a lot of silos and a lot of times decisions are made across different groups and they all have different objectives. And so you're basically, for us at least as a, as a service provider, you know, it's a choice of who's in charge, what are they charged with? How can we help make them that beacon that other people want to join? Uh, and that, uh, unfortunately, I think is the truth of AI adoption today. You almost have to find that pro pocket of brilliance for most big companies before you can get everybody else on board. If you try and get everybody on board and there's no chief marketing technologist or whatever the three letter thing is that's the answer today, um, yeah, it just, it unfortunately doesn't work. I mean, that's the reality. And, and I always say, we're not waiting for AI. Like AI is here and it can help us. We're waiting for organizations capable and able of adopting it. I'll go back to the black box. Um, what 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 I don't want to happen is that AI becomes this thing that agencies um, bring solutions. And I said on the agency side um, to marketers saying you need this thing. So you know, five years ago when everyone's like, hey, that DMP thing, you guys need it. You need this, and they're like, oh my gosh, I bet you know, IT and the markets are like, hey. I think I need this DMP thing. I'm not sure what it does, but they're telling me that I need it, so I'm going to go buy one. And so what I don't want it to be is, is that we go out and say, guys, everyone needs an AI layer unless there's a use case of what we're solving for. So that's just kind of my, my, my warning to heed of actually, yes, it can be very powerful for the right use case and the right solution set, um, but don't let it be scary that you need something. You need to run and get something before you know what you're solving for. Um, because I think that could be actually a downturn for the industry versus actually a, a positive use case of how we can apply it. I also think it's another uh, <clears throat> thing back about programmatic, and I can't remember who said this uh, earlier, that uh, it was this promise of a, this either digital silver bullet and it's programmatic media and that's how we're going to buy everything and it's just going to you know, solve all your problems. And I think that it's this is just another potential pitfall to say, I'm going to solve all your problems through AI, and um, so my caution and my take on the watch out is essentially just like don't throw all your eggs in that basket. And say this is the thing that's going to solve your problems. It's another tactic. It's a smart tactic, and each client's different, and their need state and their KPIs are going to be different. And so it's just figuring out how you answer those and how those can help. Before I send the next, say the next thing, can I have a um, raise of hands of anyone that handles procurement in the room? 
excellent, no one's here. So don't let procurement actually tell you that you need 20 less FTEs because AI is going to supplant everything that you actually do. Um, so, so that's going to be the next frontier of actually procurement actually saying, well, AI is here. So I had, you know, 45 FTEs. Now I have, I only need, you know, 15 or 20. Um, there will be efficiencies, but that those efficiencies should be put towards strategic thinking um, and what that means, the so what. Um, so if there's automation of actually understanding what the data is, then we can focus our brains on the human intel of the so what. So. Yeah, that's part of procurement's random generator of yes, things exactly. to Yes, exactly. It's on to the next right. thing, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So. I think that <laughs> one of the <laughs> more benign but real risks um, are just in sort of the the lack of accountability that uh, you know can be seen with people using AI systems, and then you know removing people from the equation rather than involving them in different roles. And so, you know, one example in the news like this week is um, ProPublica finding that you know Uber ads were able to be. Uber job ads were able to be targeted exclusively to males on the platform, which has been illegal for 45 years. And that's a fairly easy check to remove, but it's much more difficult to see if your AI system or whatever automated system you have has found a target that's really effective, but it's only serving ads to 97% males. Technically not illegal, but is that ethical? Is anyone looking for that? When you don't have teams of people in spreadsheets trying to figure out which site one at a time to, to buy ads on, um, that's fantastic. But that's an opportunity to have them step back and look at what are you actually trying to do and achieve. And you know, you can't shirk responsibility by saying, oh, well, the yeah, I did it. That's something that we need to bear and we need to keep in mind as we develop these systems. And I, I do think AI will have more governmental influence and compliance in general. Even as you mentioned the ethical responsibilities in that example, you look at programmatic and everybody in this room has dove harder and harder and harder to at some point have their own compass from their own stance as a brand with how much they're willing to push that boundary to get that CPA or conversion. You're right next to Starbucks, serve them four times, get them in that door. Um, you know, is that ethical? Like, do, do you want to be hit with that? But yet that's what everybody's doing. And what has that done? It's moved movements like GDPR in Europe. It's moved to say, hey, now we're going to go backwards. I'm glad you really loved all that behavioral targeting and that amazing efficiency and CPA you got, but you're going to have to find a different way because that PII data and things that we're going that we're authorizing is going to fundamentally come back because now there's going to be governing control. I think you're going to see AI is going to even be more critical to governmental compliance stepping in and then each indus industry stepping in in a way to really punish and go after um, companies that are violating certain things that protect all of us as consumers or just individuals regardless of the industry self-driving cars things like that are going to be um, you know really um, uh, measured by the government I actually look at a little bit differently in the sense of and I agree with you there is going to be more regulation but uh, who had heard of Cambridge Analytica before Cambridge Analytica right like nobody it's like they did data stuff right but what that kind of realization has done to customers is now they realize the value and the application of their own data. So if we for a minute put our professional selves aside and think of ourselves as customers and consumers, I think the average person realizing the value and the application of their data is actually going to make our lives easier. Because they're going to be looking for and expecting the things that we can do and more accepting of it as long as we recognize the boundary, right? So. If I am the dentist reminding you to have your cleaning, as opposed to I'm the radiologist reminding you of your chemo treatment, right? There are very different, very different expectations there. Uh, and as long as we as marketers respect those, I think consumers are going to be more open to us using their data. I think they're going to recognize the value of that data. Yeah, I think the only challenge I have is that we're usually ahead of what the average That's consumer right. knows yeah. is being used. Totally. Yep. So to your point, now I know what's happening with my data, but what's four years that someone else is using that I have no idea that now all of a sudden there's someone showing up because my tire pressure is low and they're like, $5, I'd like to fill your tire while I'm walking to work. Like I didn't know my data could do that. So what's already happening yep. post that? So yes, I'm more conscious of what's happening now, but what's the next step? That oh you know well, something, something like you, so you just said, your tires flat and somebody's yeah. there to fix it that'd be a that might be a good thing right. you know 
Uh, but you know what I mean. So I do agree. There's yeah. a, there's a combination of both. I think. And I, and I think to Kate's point, I think when you look at when you think about the proliferation of it and how that starts to reallocate human resources in terms of more strategic thinking so that we can apply some parameters around it and guardrails so that it's not irresponsible but it's still as smart as it could it could ever be so the whole thing yeah you're not doing pivot tables anymore yes right <laughs> but you your time is spent thinking about how those pivot tables what's going into those pivot tables and what the data that's going into the AI and the machine learning technologies that you're working with um, is so much better and can actually bring more value to people. Um, last question, and then I know we'll take questions from um, uh, from the audience here. Just generally speaking, what are some uh, start thought starters for for you guys? Um, you, you know, talk to the audience about just some of the things that can help you get started, even thinking about AI. Uh, if if a marketer comes to you, if a client comes to you. You know, we want to talk about AI. How do you get started thinking about it? I would say take inventory of what you've got, right? Take inventory of what you have and then identify your gaps. And that's where the gaps combined with whatever your pressing needs are, that's going to be the opportunity you should look for AI to help with. Um, bring a business or marketing challenge. Um, and AI may be part of that. Um, it may not be the solution, but it's probably something that's in the back end and when it comes to machine learning. So if you're actually focused on what are you trying to solve for, you can say, hey, is, can AI help in this way? And, and tell me what that looks like. What does that mean? Um, because that's a teaching moment, a learning moment for both of you guys to have that conversation. Um, it may not be the solve, but at least you can actually have that conversation. So, and it's, it'll be meaningful for you guys to go back and say, here's what I'm trying to solve for. And oh, by the way, there's a component of AI that can actually help me. Um, and then you can begin to, to surface as, as a case study around the organization to show what that means and what AI means. And it doesn't have to be this black box that only a certain group of people touch. I agree. I think incorporating just AI into your day-to-day -day work is really important. We have something called the visionary.com. It's a newsletter. It just kind of aggregates and curates AI content across the web having team meetings, having someone just talk about something interesting with AI they read about, how it was applied to solve maybe something else, so that it doesn't become as scary, and mm -hmm. it just kind of creates that opportunity for you, your team, even bringing it to your, your management team, to just kind of have some of these things start to seed, so that you do then open your brain to actually thinking about the strategic kind of game you might want to try something or test something. But if it's not incorporated, people are hesitant to want to adopt it. Um, so I think how you how you weave it into your everyday is really important. Um, not just on the solutions to solve for like a campaign, um, but literally how do you or how do we from classes train ourselves to be more of a strategic thinker if you know they're just propped up in pivot tables. How could we, let's, let's not do pivot tables this week, let's try to think is there a solution out there that could do it for us? Has anybody heard of anything? I think it's those types of challenges, even operationally, that you should be. Uh, I think Katie was right. You know, it starts with the brief. What are we trying to solve for? Um, and we've already talked ad nauseum at various ways in which machine learning is being applied to various media problems that we're all in this room solving. So, surprise client, you're probably already utilizing it. Um, but it goes back to so now what? What is it you're trying to solve? Is it more of that, or is it something new? And then from there, let's start that point of discussion. Yeah, I mean, our approach really reduces it to two questions and that's what do you know today and what are you trying to achieve and I think those are questions that we've been asking for a long time when responding to briefs um, the difference today is that you have to be a little more rigorous in your definition so that you can take advantage of all this new technology great so let's take a few minutes see if we have any questions and in, uh, in the audience Any questions? Probably talk loud enough anyway. So what it sounds like to me, I mean, really, is we've been doing this for years and years and years and years. What is it that's really brought this to the forefront of marketers' minds? Is it just because we are doing so much more programmatic and we're like, oh, yeah, that's AI? Like, you know, why are we having this conversation right now? Why didn't we have it five years ago or 10 years ago when we've really been doing this for so long? 
I blame Adweek. <laughs> the ANA, Adweek, yeah, right. data drudgery. Right. I, yeah. I actually blame Pepper. Um, if you know who Pepper is, IBM Watson's robot. <laughs> so I do think like subtle things yeah. like Pepper just yeah. kind of came out. And we just, not even in your space, you're like, there's this robot that's interacting with me. I'm asking questions. It's acknowledging me. And it just started again, sparking, like, what, what is this? And then, yes, just the all of the drudgery of the, what's going on and like how do all these things apply, I think it's kind of just been a ripple effect across. We hear of a self-driving car. Wait a minute, how's that technology and how does that apply to marketing and advertising? There's got to be something. If you can drive a car, you should be able to use some technology to get me that perfect CPA uh, uh, goal achieved. You know, So you know, I think that's where I would guess it's kind of been a lot more recently. One of my favorite quotes, <laughs> I can't remember who said it. Uh, as it relates to AI, we are out of the high school sex phase of this, meaning everyone's talking about it, no one's doing it. Um, and I think, Taylor, to your point, it's just become so everything, not just from how we're buying media, but how Spotify or even Pandora to some degree, shout out, is finding what song you want to listen to. Um, how you know, a retailer like Walmart or Amazon might suggest this is the type of product that you might be interested in. And so as this is all coming to a head, as people are becoming more savvy because there's more information at our fingertips, I think then thanks to adding some rabbit headline, threw it out there, and now it's got five of us on the panel. But, but it's, pers it's personal experience too. I mean, to the point of voice recognition has come a really long way. I, you know, I'm old enough to remember when Chrysler put it in like in 1984 in New York and it was like, your door is ajar. No, it's not. You know, it's open. And natural language and that responsiveness, that sort of conversation we can have with technology today really makes us uh, more accepting and more aware of it. So it is, it's, it's our personal lives sort of entering our professional lives going, how can that help us? Now, someone, I think you mentioned self-driving cars. One of my favorite examples, what happens when a self-driving car gets confused? There's a startup in California that literally the self-driving car calls. There's a person basically driving a big video game with screens that gets the car out of that situation. You know, so we have to remember that for all of the plumbing going on behind the scenes that we talk about up here and this greatness of AI, it does in fact rely on human elements a lot. Thank you. So I think the great promise of AI is the personalization that it offers, but I think it also raises some concerns about transparency and privacy protection. So my question is for the companies, be it a brand or a technology platform, whose responsibility, or even the government, whose responsibility is it for making sure that people are informed when they're interacting with you know, an AI interface and who's ultimately responsible for ensuring privacy protection? So I hope we have the next six hours to talk about GDPR. <laughs> yeah. yeah? I, I think that's, that is. I mean, is. GDPR is out to do that. And what's funny, the, the craziest and probably hardest thing about GDPR is there's nowhere you can go to get certified, right? You only know when you get in trouble. <laughs> and so you do, you have to rely on your partners. You have to rely on the technology that's available to get consent. And then you've got to have, and I know a lot of people in this room are going to cringe when I say the word, but you have to have a good legal team that you trust and understands what's going on to design those opt-in moments, right? To design those user agreements that no one reads anyway. Um, and, and then I think we have talked about it a few times. Ethically, you as marketers have to make the right choices. What is going to be acceptable to my customers in what moments? The way I liken it too is obviously we have Gum Gum Dental. And in Gum Gum Dental, we have to be HIPAA compliant. You don't walk into a doctor's office. You walk into a doctor's office. You don't ask, what are you going to do with my personal mm -hmm. information? You know they are obligated by the law to protect you and everything. So you go into the doctor and say, do I like this doctor? Do I connect with them? Do they have a good record? You go to that, not to all of what are you doing with all my personal information? How are you doing this? How are you getting me this? Where is it going, right? And that's the government, and that's stepping in and building those walls of safety um, for all of us. And so, yes, to Bill's point, I think that's where you see these GDPRs coming in and say, I should feel like I'm going to a site because I enjoy the layout, I like the editor, I shouldn't worry about whether it's real news or fake news, I shouldn't realize whether they're gonna you know, show up at my car to fill my tire because it's low on air. You should feel comfortable that that's why you're, you know, where you're consuming content in your everyday. 
but I also think right now that's a little bit aspirational. It's yeah, where the, the, the standards need to go to. Yeah. Um, and I think that for all the companies, hopefully all of us up here, spend a lot of time with our legal counsel making sure that we were GDPR compliant. Um, it's just a matter of time be before mm -hmm. that becomes global. Um, and so setting those standards and practices now um, before it actually is um, implemented and asked for in all the different regions is the way that, that we're looking at it and many others as well. It's just a matter of time. It's not a matter of if. Um, and that will actually create standards and practices that we can all align to a HIPAA-like industry standard, not only for the AI, but across the board, so that we can get past the, the, the transparency um, and, and not feel kind of dirty. Like programmatic had this dirty feel years ago. Like I don't want AI to have that dirty feel. I want to say, here are the standards. It's an opt-in basis. Here's what it does do. You can opt in or out of it. And there's a transparent conversation that's going on. Great, and we have time for one more question. Okay, I, can, I have kind of a selfish question. So we're talking about AI and all the different uses of it from dental to advertising, et cetera. And so future, I have small children, i.e. I need to worry about my future and them taking care of me. <laughs> so for Zaxis, I know that our traders work in conjunction with Copilot, our AI. Um, Phil, you guys have some great things at GumGum. Gum. What should I be telling my kids, my nieces and nephews, et cetera? Who's going to be working with these? Is it an engineer? I know like earlier this year, it's like I told my kids, you need to be data scientists. It's all about data. Who are these people that's going to power our AI, the different forms of AI, so that I can have a nice future in <laughs> okay. I've heard it's you. So, <laughs> yeah, I have, I, I don't have children, but I have two nephews that are young, right? Okay. So we talk about this all the time, convincing my sister to send them to an Ivy League school. This whole thing's happening, and she's like, we stop. Um, and I really, from my fundamental belief, and I think Katie touched on this a little bit, is it's going to be about first interpersonal skills and to be able to socially solve things yeah. and be strategic critical thinkers. I think engineering is a hot thing right now, but even within engineers, right, their technical capabilities are not going to carry them into a sole AR driven world without that ability to analyze, interact, have a human connection, yeah. solve. And I think those are going to be key. You will be seeing very successful people within the AI world who have English majors or liberal arts majors who just are just bringing a different element to really being able to craft that. And that's where I would, I think it's going to be a combination of understanding the technical to a certain extent, but really being able to interpret and then and, and be, be strategic. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, okay. I'd say let them be wherever they want. Yeah. Wow. And, and to sure that, I actually, um, I was, I was listening to an episode of Radio Lab. Um, so if you don't listen to Radio Lab, listen to Radio Lab. That's the plug. There's any WNYC people in the house. Um, but they actually were talking about um, AI, not as it relates to what we're talking about, but it was talking about therapy. And there is a researcher in um, Spain. And they are utilizing AI and um, VR, whereby you essentially immerse yourself in this experience and you find yourself um, talking to a likeness of Sigmund Freud. And you're prompted then to speak like something that's weighing on you to Sigmund Freud. Because I ask you, what, what are you thinking about? So you speak to it. And then it swaps once you say what you're saying. So now you are seeing yourself in this place and you are now taking place Sigmund Freud. And without going through like everything about this, what they found was this type of thinking, which has nothing to do with like putting the right medicine for the right person at the right time, was actually able to prove successful in clinical trials and helping people like a normal therapist would. My wife, who's a who is a psychotherapist, listened to this and she had her own opinions on it. But the fact of the matter is like, so it's, it's, it's what you're you're speaking to. The future is not necessarily like who's going to code it, because yeah, that's part of it. But being able to understand it, and then how do you apply it to things beyond just, you know, right message, right place, right time, or some sort of technical aspect? So let them be dreamers, let them do whatever they want. I'm sure it'll be just fine. Yep. I, I think about it as have you seen uh, Ready Player One? Yeah. Have you seen the circle? You like combine those two things and you think, all right, that's a warning. And I do think that we need to have the interpersonal skills. I do, and I worry, I've got a 15 year old, trust me, it's like, all right, do you actually talk to your friends or you just text them you text them when you're standing next to them you know what 
and I, I think we do. We, we need to encourage them to interact with the real world and with each other, you know, not just via their devices. And that's going to be, I mean, we probably all see it, right? Yeah. How many engineers do you take on sales meetings with you? You know, every once in a while, nothing against engineers, but yeah, you need people who can, who can speak English. Or just have them be an esports gamer and make millions of dollars playing. Or that, games. that's the other option. <laughs> <laughs> that hurts. I know. Wow. <laughs> All right, great. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Let's have a round of applause for our panel. Thank you, everybody. I know. All right, thank you all for coming. We'll do the raffle really quick. And um, please be sure to uh, sign up for the upcoming events. We still have a couple tickets left for our Twins game next week. And then um, we will have our Halloween party next. All right, so we have a Southwest gift card from a Moby. Maddie Jansen from Merkel. I used to work with Bruce at a previous oh, yeah? company. Uh, okay. He was my CFO of uh, Vio okay. Networks yeah. back in the day. And then he took some time. Super great guy. He, he's the nicest. He looks like he would be like, you know, he's just like the sweetest man. Like, we have a yeah. gift basket from Seismic. Kristen Erickson from Compass Point. Apple AirPods from Zaxxas. Nicole Hennen from Compass Point. And finally, a vacation package from Gum Gum. Belle Allen from Hayworth. All right, well, once again, thank you so much to our, our sponsors and panelists from Gum Gum, Zaxxas, Seismic, and Amobi, as well as uh, Jeff and Greg from Essence and Hayworth. Thank you, everyone. It's an easy flight. Half the time.